The committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission. This morning we will review the enormous task confronted in the Gulf as a result of the BP oil spill and the Obama administration's choices made then and to this day. It is clear that this was a man-made disaster, that 11 people died in what should not have happened. But it is the choices after an initial event that we will focus on today. That is not to take away BP's ultimate responsibility. But this committee reviews government actions, both prospectively and retrospectively. We cannot expect to do a better job next time if we do not focus on what was done right and what was done wrong in this disaster. The government made several decisions under its authority. One of them was not to use the Stafford Act and, in fact, to leave the very entity that created this pollution in a position of authority and lead. There are many reasons this may have happened, but we have to ask, should it happen again? Congress has the clear power and authority to change the rules of the road. We should not have to choose between holding a polluter responsible and empowering leaders at the Federal, State, and local letter, level to do what they are responsible to do on behalf of their citizens. The reimbursement for actions directly and indirectly belongs to British Petroleum. They have said they will meet that challenge, and we will hold them to it. But as the days and weeks went on after an initial spill 40-some miles out at sea, it became obvious that we lacked the resources in place to do the job that was coming. The response was slow and chaotic. Additionally, we will hear from testimony today that the secondary damage turned out to be, in many cases, far worse than the little or no oil that came to the shores of communities. That is part of what we have to deal with here today. Oil spills and other events are inevitable. In my hometown of Cleveland, more than 60 years ago, a liquefied, a liquefied natural gas container went bad and many died. It has not stopped us from resourcing and using natural gas here in America. Three Mile Island is still in the memory of people my age. It has not stopped us from using nuclear fuel as a primary source for base load. Coal miners, to our dismay, continue to die re trying, to, uh, <clears throat> to, trying to harvest that fuel around the world. It is a necessary part of our society that dangerous jobs are done by people who choose to do them and have a right to be protected in that process. But this hearing is not about the riskiness of any of these fuel sources. It is, in fact, about whether the Federal Government knows better this time than they did before this event. Additionally, it is important for us to understand that just as uh, Hurricane Katrina told us that FEMA had problems working with States, FEMA was not necessarily ready for a loss of vast areas of response. We now know that even when all the response capabilities were in place, even when it was a single event of a company that did not do their job and did not play properly by the rules, we find secondary events throughout the area. 
we find oil coming ashore and not being responded to for a number of reasons. We additionally find a loss of revenue in unrelated areas. We will hear from our second panel and from our first that the loss of tourism was needless and extreme in areas in which the water was clean, the shore was pristine, and, in fact, people were scared away. We need to make sure that does not happen again. We need to make sure that governors and local officials are empowered to do what is in the best interest of their people and that the American people get a fair understanding of the scope of any problem or spill. Lastly, we will hear today that as a result of one reckless action, we find countless billions of dollars of revenue lost, good, hardworking Americans out of work, resources necessary to make us more, less oil reliant on countries that often are not friendly to us, leaving for the very countries that, in fact, will now produce the oil that we are forced to buy. In America today, both sides of the aisle talk about jobs. I, for one, am not an economist, but I can understand that if $400 billion worth of purchased oil were produced here in America, there would be countless millions of direct and indirect jobs available to Americans. There are many things that we are not competitive on here in America. Certainly one of them we are competitive on is natural resource extraction from our coastal waters and onshore locations. I look forward to hearing from my old friend and a considerably uh, well-known figure to all of us and a great governor, Governor Barber. And with that, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Let me first welcome Governor Barber, and I thank you very much for being with us today. I also want to take a moment to recognize Dick Gregory, who is uh, a person who has fought hard for so many people for so long uh, in our audience. And thank you, Mr. Gregory, for being a part of this hearing today. Um, Governor Barber, your state has been through a tremendous amount of uh, difficulty, and I sincerely look forward to your testimony. Let me also welcome Michael Bromwich from the Department of Interior. Uh, Mr. Bromwich, you agreed to be here with incred incredibly short notice, so we thank you very much for your testimony and for your expertise. Finally, let me welcome the residents of the Gulf who have traveled here today to share their views uh, with the committee. Earlier this year, the National Commission on the Deep, BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill issued a comprehensive report on the causes of the spill. The report found that this disaster was avoidable and that it resulted from clear mistakes made in the first instance by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean, and by government officials. These were extremely difficult lessons to learn. I am encouraged that now, more than a year later, officials in both the oil industry and our government appear to be heeding these lessons and retooling the way they do business. First, we must never, ever forget that 11 individuals lost their lives in an explosion on April 20th. To address deficiencies that contributed to these deaths, the Interior Department issued an improved workplace safety rule that many, many, including industry, believe will significantly enhance worker safety. The Department also completely reorganized the Minerals Management Service. MMS uh, had been criticized because it oversaw the safety of drilling, the environmental impacts caused by drilling, and the revenue generated from drilling. According to the National Commission, MMS had a built-in incentive to promote offshore drilling in sharp tension with its mandate to ensure safe drilling and environmental protection. The Department also implemented a number of critical safety measures to ensure that a blowout like this would never happen again. For example, a new drilling safety rule strengthened standards for well control procedures, drilling equipment, and well design, and it required independent and third-party inspections. Finally, the Department issued a notice to leasees to require oil companies to demonstrate that they can actually cap a well, that they can actually cap a well and handle a deep water blowout before any new drilling permits were, were issued. These were responsible steps taken after it became clear to the Nation 
after 87 days that BP simply did not have the technology available. In other words, the technology was far outdistancing our, our ability to control it. Mr. Chairman, I have to say that I am disappointed by your actions today. You stated that the committee investigations have interviewed more investigators have interviewed more than 50 government officials, scores of residents, business owners, and whistleblowers as part of this investigation. That is news to everyone on this side of the aisle because you completely excluded us from that effort, and you have not explained why. Unfortunately, uh, this is a definition of partisanship, and it undermines the integrity of this committee. And uh, by the way, this report. Uh, that is being submitted this morning was submitted to the repress before we even saw it. Nevertheless, moving forward, it is our obligations as members of the United States Congress to develop constructive ways to help people in the Gulf rebuild their lives and their livelihoods. In my former capacity as chairman of the Subcommittee on Coast Guard and Maritime Transportation, I visited the Gulf twice while oil was flowing from the Macondo well. I saw firsthand how this bill affected small businesses and other industries that were decimated by the spill. I have offered several measures to provide real solutions to Gulf residents. Last Congress, I offered a provision in the legislation that cut in half from 90 days to 45 days the amount of time responsible parties had to settle claims arising from the spill. I also worked on provisions with Chairman Oberstar to strengthen the Coast Guard's oversight of, of oil spill response plans. This year, just recently, I offered an amendment to H.R. 1229 to require all oil and gas exploration, development, and production activities in the Gulf to be conducted by U.S. flag vessels, talking about jobs, that is jobs, this, this, uh, this which would have immediately stimulated the Gulf uh, e e economy. Unfortunately, the Rules Committee did not allow a vote on my amendment. My basic point is this. We have a tremendous opportunity in this committee to really help people, people who have, who have undergone extreme hardship. As a goal for today's hearing, if we can focus our efforts on identifying even one positive, proactive solution that we can all agree on, then I think today's hearing will be a success. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I thank you. I ask uh, for one minute unanimous consent to respond without objection. To my ranking member, uh, just for your edification, this investigation began under your predecessor, Chairman Towns. We went down jointly and separately. He authorized minority trips when I was in the minority, in addition to the joint trips we did, including members of both parties. When I took the chair, we continued that investigation. We have had joint trips. In addition to we have authorized minority trips down there. As a matter of fact, we have never turned down a request by the minority to, uh, to go on staff uh, fact-finding. Every request that has been asked for has been granted. It is true that both your side and my side, under both the majority and minority, have gone both together and independently. But I certainly think that I, don't, I will not belittle any effort that your side made to get at individual and independent facts. I hope you were not intending to do so by saying that you were surprised that we had made 50 trips when some of them were made together. Mr. Chairman, may I have a minute? Of course. Let me say this, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, this is, as I said from the very beginning, uh, I, I, my number one concern is helping the American people, and it is about the integrity of this committee. Uh, I do not belittle for one second uh, the findings and the things that the majority has done. What I am saying is that we want to be a true partner in all of that. I have said to you privately and openly that we, too, care about government operating properly. We, too, care about making sure that every agency of government does what it is supposed to do. We, too, want to make sure that there is no agency that is caught up in a culture of mediocrity. We refuse to have that, and we have said that to this administration and we have said it to any administration. So I look forward to going forward. I don't, like I said, I want to move on, but I wanted to make it clear that we, too, are partners. We, too, were elected by 700,000 people per district. And so we want to make sure our voices are heard, too, and I appreciate your comments. I thank the gentleman. And with that, we are prepared to introduce our first panel. I am going to deny myself the honor of introducing Governor Barber and instead go to the newest member of the Mississippi delegation, uh, Congressman Stephen Palazzo, for his introduction of his governor. And I understand your governor when you were in the State House. 
The gentleman is recognized for an introduction. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members for allowing me the privilege of introducing someone who I believe will provide your committee with the most credible testimony today. I have experienced his leadership firsthand after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina and more recently the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Indeed, no other governor has been as frequently challenged to rise to the occasion of leading a state during a time of crisis, whether man-made or natural. And each time, Governor Barber shouldered the burden of leadership in a manner that calmed tempers, mended broken hearts, and resulted in credible, efficient outcomes. To accomplish this, he met each event with a balanced regimen of compassion and order, uh, laying fears and the sense of loss with hope and the prospect of swift recovery. I vividly remember the many times the governor and his beautiful wife, Marcia, walked hand in hand with the victims and in the aftermath, aftermath of it all, assured them that everything was going to be all right. More recently, he continues to guide our state through historical floods and a severe tornado season. He has not only led Mississippi through the country's worst natural and man-made disaster, but he challenged us to build back bigger and better. He is a great leader in every sense of the word, and of course I am talking about Mississippi's 63rd Governor, Haley Barber. Mr. Chairman, as someone who represents a district devastated by the oil spill, I appreciate you directing the committee to assess the recovery efforts of BP and the Obama administration. I would like to briefly mention that as someone who has worked offshore on drilling platforms, I have a particular concern on how the administration came to the decision to institute a moratorium without conducting a study of how it will impact the Gulf Coast economy. We know now that this thoughtless decision will decrease oil production by up to 250,000 barrels per day for the next two years. A loss of production at this magnitude will continue to have a negative impact on the Gulf Coast economy for years to come. Studies conducted by Louisiana State University put potential estimated job loss by the moratorium and subsequent permatorium on the Gulf Coast region at around 24,000. The ripple effect of these lost jobs and high energy prices hurts our national economy. The majority of the jobs lost in Mississippi are from the 4th Congressional District of Mississippi, the district I represent. I have worked offshore. I know the value of the jobs that the offshore drilling industry provides. I look forward to further investigation into the economic impact of the administration's decisions and their motivations. I applaud the committee for the extensive work on this critical issue, and I look forward to hearing the testimony by the witnesses and the outcome of this important hearing. And thank you again, Chairman Issa and the members for allowing me the honor of introducing Governor Haley Barber. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, pursuant to the rules of the committee, Governor, would you rise to take the oath? Governor, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect that the Governor answered in the affirmative. Governor, you know this routine. You have seen it for years. Uh, your entire statement will be placed in the record. We will not hold you to an exact five minutes, but uh, come as close as you can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized. And to the ranking member and all the members of the committee, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I am going to not read my statement. Uh, let me start off by saying that uh, this disaster, very different from other disasters, uh, when, when Representative Palazzo talks about Katrina, we had utter obliteration on the coast. We had places where it looked like the hand of God had just wiped away the Gulf Coast for blocks and for some place for miles. We had hurricane force winds 240 miles inland. And to get people where they got confident that the coast was going to come back, where they had hope for their families and their communities, where they were willing to return home was an enormous part of, of the job. In this case, keeping people calm. You, know, you had a, a, an oil well to blow out 100 plus miles away from our coast. And I should say at this point, this experience for us was a little different than for Louisiana. Louisiana was closer to the well. They got wet brown oil into some of their areas. We didn't. Uh, we were about 108 miles from the wellhead to the city of Gulfport, and by the time oil got to us, A, it had been a long time since the well blew out. 
be what got to us you would not recognize as oil. Uh, there was this orange mixture of water and the remnant of oil that the, the, that the oil people call moose. Uh, and then there were what we call tar balls and tar patties. When I was a kid, we used to go to the beach, we used to throw them at each other, tar balls, because the Gulf of Mexico seeps out somewhere as much as a million four hundred thousand barrels a year according to the USGIS, uh, every year through the floor. So, you know, we, we, were, we were used to tar balls, but when this happened, people were obviously very, very concerned, and one of the big jobs was to keep people calm, to keep people understanding we're going to prepare, we're going to have a good plan, we're going to have the resources to execute the plan, we're going to protect the coast, particularly the habitat, particularly the coastal marshlands where the shrimp and, the, and other uh, important wildlife actually are born and, and start to grow. And we had to do that with a, a different set of rules. And the first point I want to make is the Stafford Act. The decision was made that this disaster would be managed under the Oil Pollution Act. Uh, not the Stafford Act. As has been said to the committee by others, a disadvantage of that for us is we are used to the Stafford Act. Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, we have managed disasters under the Stafford Act because that is what hurricanes are managed under. That is what tornadoes are managed under. That is what uh, floods like we have in Mississippi today. So, A, it was, a, it, it was something we knew. But very important from a governor's point of view, the Stafford Act expressly says that the Federal Government will supplement the work of the State, not supplant it. One of the problems we had under the, Stafford, under the Oil Pollution Act early on, and lasted for several weeks, the Coast Guard, who headed the Unified Command, uh, and we are accustomed to Unified Command, we have Unified Command under, under Stafford Act disasters. They took the position that the National Guard worked for them. And this became a real issue, which I will talk about in a minute. But under the Stafford Act, it is very clear. The National Guard works for the governor unless the president federalizes the National Guard. We are not mad at anybody about it, but it didn't work well when they tried to assume command over the National Guard. And I should say, President Bush, after Katrina, talked about federalizing the response. And I very loudly and publicly said no, that we don't want the Army coming into Mississippi or the Marines coming into Mississippi. They are not trained for that. They don't know the terrain. They don't know the people. So Stafford Act, uh, whether, and the Stafford Act, by the way, has a lot of improvement that it needs. But the Oil Pollution Act ought to be changed to say flatly, like the Stafford Act, it is supplemental to the States and it doesn't usurp the States authority. Where this came into play was in our plan to defend the States shoreline against oil. We developed a, a layered defense plan beginning outside the Barrier Islands, using the Barrier Islands to protect us, protecting the gaps between the Barrier Islands, Water, that oil that got through to the sound, that would be our principal place to try to pick it up, to keep it from getting to shore, steer it toward beaches, keep it out of marshlands. As it turned out, the Coast Guard approved that plan, never understood how to execute it. And after the second time that oil got to our barrier islands, completely undetected, not much less contested, undetected, we demanded that we be put in charge of this. And the Coast Guard agreed, and we worked out a system that worked. I will just tell you, before that, there was no command and control. In fact, United, uh, Unified Command could not even speak to the hundreds of vessels of opportunity that we had gotten BP to hire to form picket lines to spot the oil as far out where we could try to steer it and collect it. They didn't have any means of talking to them. So we had to set that up to get command and control as it should be. 
two other points I want to make, and I'll be glad that I'm trying not to get into too much detail. For us, this turned out to be primarily an economic disaster. Now, it may be that there is something lurking beneath the sea or that is going to develop that becomes eco ecologically dangerous. And, and we are all over that, and not just Mississippi, all the states, the Federal Government, all kinds of scientists. But thus far, the environmental damage for us, again, we are different from Louisiana, has been very manageable. We have, uh, on the coastline of Mississippi, we have 80 miles of coastline. We never closed one mile of beach except for one time in the whole experience. We had one two-mile section of beach that we closed overnight because we had a high tide after a hurricane where some oil got across the highway and we couldn't clean it all up. Otherwise, we cleaned up the oil that got to the beaches every day the day it got there. So our environmental damage, unless there is something to come, is not our issue. Our issue is a, is a gigantic economic loss. Uh, talked about tourism. Our tourism industry was clobbered. Uh, our season starts when our schools get out, which are earlier than in the north. Our schools get out the middle of May. So that is when the tourist season starts. Of course, this happened late April. So people saw on TV the same brown pelican coated with looked like three inches of oil. I mean, it looked like a chocolate pelican. And they showed it every hour, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And the news media, particularly 24-hour cable TV, gave citizens the impression the whole Gulf Coast was coated in oil. People deduced from that that it was unsafe, unpleasant, don't want to go there. They canceled their reservations. They canceled their uh, contracts to buy condominia, and not just in Mississippi, but all across the Gulf Coast. Uh, the President, to his credit, actually it got so bad that the President came to Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida and held news conferences on the beach to say, look, the beaches are clean, the water is clear, it is beautiful down here, come on down here. But that one news day can't compete with what was being seen every day, every hour for weeks. Huge economic problem and loss there. And then, of course, in the fishing side on seafood, huge losses because they closed our waters. And I should say to you right now, we have not, since this oil spill, had one sample of seafood in Mississippi waters that was tested that did not pass the test and meet every standard. The same is true for the Federal Government. We haven't had one, one sample of seafood that failed. Yet we have people that won't buy seafood from the Gulf Coast in New York, in San Francisco, in Chicago, because of what they saw on television. So the fishermen had some mitigation of their losses because they got hired to be vessels of opportunity. The processors were slammed. So seafood, a huge problem. Uh, the oil and gas industry, the moratorium for which there was no reason. In fact, the government appointed a panel to look at this, and the panel disagreed with the uh, announcement that was made that you got the impression it was the panel's recommendation to have a moratorium. And the panel afterwards said, whoa, that wasn't in our recommendation. We are against that. That was added after the panel was through. We have drilled more than 31,000 oil wells in the Gulf of Mexico in the last 50 years. And this is the first time anything vaguely like this has happened. The moratorium hurt us financially, more importantly, hurt the country. Thirty percent of all the oil domestically produced in the U.S. is in the Gulf of Mexico, and about 80 percent of that is deep water. Yet, in the last year, the number of new, the number of permits for new deep water drilling has decreased 85 uh, percent. And that is a huge problem. Let me close by saying this. For those of you all that want to help the states that were, that were hurt, understanding that this was an economic problem for us 
And, and again, Louisiana is a little different from the rest of us. This was an economic problem. Remember the natural resources damage assessments and uh, the payments that can be made under that are largely limited to environmental. And uh, while there is some loss of use room there, largely these states cannot be compensated from their economic loss except by getting part of the civil fines that are going to be assessed against BP and the responsible parties. And I would ask you to consider, as members of Congress, looking at this and understanding that this is, that this is the best way to help these states recover because it is economic recovery that they have to get uh, unless something really changes on the environment. I apologize I went over, Mr. Chairman. No apology required. I now ask unanimous consent that the uh, staff report entitled The BP Oil Spill Recovery Effort, The Legacy of Choices Made by the Obama Administration be entered in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I would also note for the minority that uh, after the break, it is my intention to uh, uh, have a committee vote uh, to make this a committee report. So uh, during the, this intervening period, if the minority has comments, questions, anything to add, the final report will reflect uh, comments by the, uh, the minority so that it is, in fact, a bipartisan report. The gentleman is recognized. It is my understanding that the, the, there is a three, the, according to the committee rules, we, the, we have to have three days uh, before a committee vote. That is correct. I am giving you more than 10 days notice. I thought you said today. No, no. Rule four, three days notice. Right. What I am doing is I'm, I'm ask, I asked and got permission to enter this in the record. It is a staff report. Okay. I am going to elevate it to a committee report after the minority has entered their comments and any adjustments are made. Right now it is the basis for a committee report. The intention is to make sure that your staff that has been working on the same set of, of facts uh, edit make changes, uh, suggest changes, make any other comments so that it becomes a joint report. And I want it to reflect both the majority and minority opinion. Uh, and and when, so and when will that vote be? It will be after the break at the earliest. Mm -hmm. So it okay. was more than 10 days okay, I, beforehand. I, I misunderstood you. I am just noticing okay. for the future. Oh, all right. Very okay. Well. And with that, I would like to recognize uh, the former chairman of the full committee, uh, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for his five-minute opening or five-minute questions. Welcome, uh, Governor Barber. It's great to see you again. And thank you, Congressman. Uh, it looks like you've elected a pretty good-looking, articulate young man to uh, serve in the Congress. So, congratulations. It'll take him long to get gray hair. <laughs> That'll come in time if he sticks around this place. Uh, first of all, let me say I have been. Uh, uh, to the Gulf Coast, not Mississippi, but I will come. And uh, I walked on the beaches down there uh, and also uh, on beaches, I believe, uh, on the east coast of Florida. And I saw these tar balls. And this was when there was no oil well problem. And so uh, when you just said that uh, 1.4 million barrels of oil leak out naturally each year, I hope everybody in the country knows that, because that amount coming out naturally doesn't cause any kind of a problem, and that ought to be uh, included in the discussion when we talk about uh, deep water drilling in the Gulf. You also said that 85 percent, there's been an 85 percent loss in drilling permits. That is tragic, especially in view of the fact that we just sent two billion dollars down to Brazil so that they can drill in deep water, and we can't. And it really surprised me. I think you said there were 31,000 wells in the last 50 years down there, and it's been done, uh, drilled without uh, any real big problems. And yet right now this administration is uh, stopping us from drilling here, and we're sending billions and billions and billions of dollars over to the Middle East to countries that don't like us very much, and that really, really bothers me. And I hope that you uh, are able to, uh, in effect, go on a crusade to tell the story that you have told us today, because I think the American people need to know that. Uh, we have the ability to move rapidly toward energy independence over the next decade if we use natural gas and oil and shale coal that can be converted into oil, and we are not doing any of that. And as a result, 
uh, this country is really suffering. And I really uh, sympathize with you on the impact, the fiscal impact that was going on that took place down there in the Gulf uh, during the, the, the uh, terrible crisis. And I want to say one more thing about the media. I, I really sympathize with you in this drumbeat that went on and on and on over a, a month or two months showing the problems that were created down there, which obviously had a devastating impact on you and your, your economy. And I hope that uh, in the future, when these kinds of tragedies occur, the media will not sensationalize it to the degree that it hurts economies like that in the Gulf states. Now, I just have a couple of questions. You said that the Stafford Act uh, uh, could have been handled, or the, it could have been handled much better under the Stafford Act. Can you elaborate? On, you may have mentioned this in your opening remarks, but what could have been done uh, that would have been better in helping to manage the problem in the Gulf? If you as governor and the governor of Louisiana uh, did have the control that you wanted. The two big reasons of the Stafford Act being preferable to state and local governments, we are used to it. We, we deal with it all the time. I think when you have some of the local officials later today, we have all had to work under the Stafford Act because that is what we do, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, et cetera. For me specifically as governor, the Stafford Act expressly says that the efforts of the Federal Government on the Stafford Act are to supplement State efforts. Under the Oil Pollution Act, there was an impression that the Federal Government was in charge under the Unified Command that they told everybody what to do. And that not only is contrary to the U.S. Constitution and bad law, but it also didn't work. I mean, it, we, our people were much better able to do things than the Federal people were able to do. Well, let me just uh, Stafford Act isn't perfect, though, yeah, as I said. I, I know, but let me just, had, had the Federal Government recognized your jurisdiction under the Stafford Act, tell me how that would have been more, uh, more of a positive uh, situation or solution for you. Where it really became very apparent, we had a defense plan to defend our shores from oil. Again, different Louisiana because we, we were 100 miles away. We recruited 1,100, quote, vessels of opportunity. Those were people who were willing to rent their votes, paid for by BP. BP never flinched at paying for this, to put them out and essentially form picket lines to try to spot the oil south of the Barrier Islands, between the Barrier Islands, in the Sound. Okay? So we had a, actually a five-layer defense. We found out weeks into that, the Coast Guard had no way of managing that. They had approved the plan. They had no way of managing that. We literally sent people to Walmart to buy radios. Uh, we had a situation where our Air National Guard, starting 4 o'clock every morning, flew and did infrared photography of the whole sound and, out and south of the sound to find the oil. The Coast Guard had no way to tell the vessels of opportunity where to go. We had to set up a whole communication system uh, and, and a command and control system, which we did not do for weeks because we thought the Coast Guard knew more about this than we did. But it turned out that we had to set up the communication system, we had to set up the command and control system, and, and, and frankly, they were cooperative when, when it got to it. That, but it should have never come to that. We were lucky that this disaster was manageable enough that you could make those kinds of mistakes and still clean them up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor. Uh, would the gentleman yield the remaining time? Uh, be happy oh, to I'm sorry, you were over. I, uh, I was over, but I'll be glad to. No, yield. no, no. We do not yield the other <laughs> side of the remaining time. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. I thank uh, the chairman for recognizing me and welcome, uh, Governor. Welcome, Representative. It's uh, very good to see you again. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for being here, uh, Governor. The the Government Accountability Office, the nine nonpartisan bipartisan uh, unit. Uh, uh, issued, uh, and I believe they are going to be testifying later on today on a panel, uh, they issued several reports uh, warning that taxpayers are not receiving a just or fair return for oil and gas leases in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, specifically, the GAO report uh, 
faulted the so-called royalty relief uh, granted by Congress in the mid-1990s when gas and oil companies were not doing as well as they are today, uh, but they encouraged additional exploration at the time when oil and gas were, were lower. And under some of these leases, oil companies pay absolutely no royalties at all uh, to the American people when they drill on Federal lands. And, and this is oil that is owned by the American people. It is on Federal lands. Uh, usually there is a, a, a royalty paid back to the government, to the taxpayers, but here they pay absolutely nothing back. And I would like to quote from their report. Special lower royalty rates, referred to as royalty relief granted on leases issued in the deep water areas of the Gulf of Mexico from 1996 to 2000, a period in which oil and gas prices and industry profits were much lower than they are today, could result in between $21 billion and $53 billion in lost revenues to the American people, to the Federal Government, compared with what it would have received without these provisions." End quote. Um, our Chairman, and in a rare expression of bipartisan support, I want to compliment you, Mr. Issa, uh, for the significant work that you have done in this area and on this issue. And uh, you had called for an end to these leases on uh, October 7, 2009. Chairman Issa issued a staff report warning that actual shortfalls to U.S. taxpayers could be much, much larger, and this is what uh, his report said, and I quote, Depending upon the market price of oil and natural gas, the total cost of foregone royalties could total nearly $80 billion. Oil and gas royalty payments represent one of the country's largest non-tax sources of revenue. Taxpayers must get every cent that is owed to them, end quote. And I agree uh, completely uh, with Chairman Issa. And, and Governor, do you agree with, with uh, Chairman Issa on this statement? Ma'am, I can tell you that we are very familiar with this, in that for more than 50 years, the rest of the country has been sucking the guff dry, and we get nothing. At the period of time you are talking about in the late 90s, all this production out of the Gulf of Mexico, and the states were paid nothing, zero, nothing. Uh, when, when you drill on government land in Wyoming, Wyoming gets some of the money. But fortunately, in the last administration, this was changed. And we are going to start on a little stair-step basis getting a little bit of the royalty and ultimately, maybe by 2017 or something, the states will get a legitimate fair share of the royalty. So I am very sympathetic to the royalty owner because we feel like we, are, we should be considered royalty owners too and that the Federal taxpayer and the taxpayer of Mississippi both mm -hmm. ought to be getting a fair royalty for the production of oil and gas or if it is if it's coal on land or whatever, uh, I think that is absolutely the case. But I hope you all will please understand, when there are only five states in the country that allow offshore drilling, the other 45 ought to let us, five who allow it, they ought to let us participate as royalty owners, too. Well, uh, the, the real royalty owner is the American taxpayer. Uh, so do you believe that the taxpayer has a right to every cent that is owed to them under these leases and that they should be completely uh, corrected, as the Chairman said. And I believe the Mississippi taxpayer should share in that when we are dealing in the waters that are Mississippi waters and are part of the outer continental shelf that is recognized as Mississippi. So, ma'am, I am not arguing with your point about the Federal taxpayers. I just want to make sure the State taxpayers get treated as royalty owners in the five States that allow this. It is not, it's not fair for the other 45 states to burn the oil that we have taken out of our outer continental shelf, and they get treated the same way we do. Well, I must— uh, That was a yes. That, that state for the record, though, when uh, 
Chairman um, Markey or Ranking Member Markey uh, has a bill on this that would correct it. And when it came before Congress early this year as an amendment and several other amendments, uh, regretfully, Chairman, uh, I see you voted against it. And, uh, and I, I feel that it, as the same as uh, Governor Barber, that this should be corrected, that the American taxpayer is entitled to uh, the royalties for oil extracted from um, taxpayer-owned, federal and state-owned uh, uh, property. And uh, I, I hope that uh, you will join with us in a bipartisan way to, to correct this going forward uh, so that there is fair treatment uh, uh, to the states and to the government and, and basically to the American taxpayer. So I hope you will join us in correcting that. We now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield my time back to the chairman for that. I would like to take it. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Congressman, you don't have to remain since we didn't swear you in, but you are welcome to stay. You look good with the governor. <laughs> uh, you always look good next to the governor. That will look good. I thank you. Tony did make a valid point, but I think I want to follow up on your, your point, too. Today, you are going to have an economic loss that will be unreimbursed as a result of the BP oil spill, correct? There is no question of that, and, as it currently stands. Right. And so for the foreseeable future, if there were to be another one, you would potentially have another oil loss in which the Federal Government was able to get fines. The Federal Government would I, mean, I don't think we actually collect royalties on what is spilled into the Gulf, but short of that, we would continue from that particular rig. That is not a, a, a relief uh, one. It is not covered by the Clinton era uh, contract failures. The fact is, you, you stand at risk without an ability to get any premium on that risk in the Gulf. And that is correct? Uh, if it is outside, well, uh, period. We are not in, compensated for, for what we do. So let me ask a straightforward question. Do you believe that from this side of the dais that we should look at legislation that provides sooner and more specific revenue sharing based on the potential risk, in other words, effectively an insurance policy where you would have revenue not for current expenditure but for contingent expenditure if you have another economic event like this? Well, two things. Uh, there is legislation that was passed, I think, in 2006 that is going to stair-step up, is going to give the states a share and stair-step it up, and, and maybe by 2017 we I think you be, get 10 percent of the royalties or something. Yeah, and we are going to go up to maybe 35 percent or something. Right. Uh, but until that goes into effect, and, and I would urge you all, put it in effect immediately. You know, go on and put, that, that's what we would like to see, put it in effect immediately. Then we would have some uh, compensation for the risk we take. Right now, the only way that I see that we can reasonably be compensated for the damage done to us is if you take the Clean Water Act fines. And there are going to be Clean Water Act fines here potentially in the billions. And that the states that were affected be given a share of that with enough flexibility that they can spend it to help their economy, that they, they not have to get the money and say, we are going to use all this money to clean up from the BP oil spill. BP has already paid to clean up for the BP oil spill. Our damage is economic damage to tourism, to the seafood industry. Not that the seafood was hurt, just nobody would buy it. Uh, they wouldn't let us fish for it. Uh, and then to the people that work in the oil and gas industry. I, Somebody mentioned the very sad thing that 11 people died on this oil rig. Four of them are from Mississippi. Now, and this well, this well wasn't in Mississippi waters, but that gives you an idea, sort of a reference, that we have a lot of people that work in this industry. And right now, you know where they are? I went and visited the Leviathan oil rig 80 miles west of Haifa, Israel. I met two guys from Mississippi who were working on that oil well in Israel who had been working in the Gulf of Mexico the year before, and they had to leave because of the moratorium. Well, we, uh, we certainly have seen a lot of those uh, rigs sail off. Uh, let me ask you a, a follow-up question. Now, you mentioned the immediate following, the too much control by the Federal Government and BP, but 
Governor, doesn't that continue till today? Isn't BP still in the driver's seat on a lot of things, including compensation? Aren't you sort of in, in a, a back-end ability to help your people? Regardless, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm a recovering lawyer, okay? So I know that a judge has ruled that the Gulf Coast uh, compensation facility, whatever it's called, that, that that is not truly independent of BP. And that may legally, technically be right. I think they are trying to do a good job. We don't get many complaints in Mississippi. They are doing something that is complicated. And I will say this about it. It is sure better than having to litigate all this, where people wouldn't get their money for years and years and years, and the trial lawyers would get half the money. So it is a long way from perfect, just like what I do is a long way from perfect. But I think it is better than the alternative of litigation. And as I say, we have cases that are difficult, cases where people are not satisfied, but we really don't get many complaints, and we have been paid, Mississippi companies, people have been paid about $340, $350 million. Yeah, let's start. Uh, and the gentlelady from New York has left, but I, uh, I might note for the record that uh, uh, I still am trying to find a constitutional way to adjust for those flawed contracts that were signed. This committee held hearings much earlier on it, found that the oil companies thought they were going to be paying royalties and were actually surprised when they found out that the defect in the contract allowed them not to. Uh, with that, I would recognize the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Governor Barber, there is a, uh, a, in the animal kingdom down in Disney World, there is a saying over the animal kingdom, and it says this. It says, we do not inherit our environment from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And in that light, you know, I read, was reading your statement, your written statement, and it said, and I quote, uh, the other major economic impact resulted from the moratorium on drilling. And I want to shift away from broad generalities and focus on specific measures to prevent this kind of massive oil spill from ever happening again. Everyone uh, remembers BP's repeated failures to cap the well. It became clear immediately that BP had no idea how to end this disaster. Every week they would try a new strategy. But it was a complete trial and error fiasco. They tried the top hat. By the way, I was down there when they were trying to build the top hat. I actually watched them do it. This was a massive steel containment dome lowered onto the well. Of course, that failed. They also uh, tried the junk shot. They injected golf balls and shredded tires and drilled fluid into the blowout preventer, but that too failed. They tried several more times until finally they tried the static kill. They basically injected mud into the blowout preventer to start regulating the flow of oil. But that all took 87 days. And it was crystal clear to everyone watching that BP simply did not have the technology to handle a deep water blowout, which I think is atrocious. Governor, I want to ask you about a specific requirement issued by the Department of the Interior to require all companies to prove that they can cap a well before receiving, receiving a, a drilling permit. It's called NTL 2010N10. And are you familiar with that requirement? I am not familiar with that specific requirement, Congressman. All right. Well, let me read exactly what it says. It says each oil company must demonstrate, and this is, an, and I quote this, that it has access to and can deploy surface and subsea containment resources that would be adequately to, adequate to promptly respond to a blowout, end of quote. Is that? And so, uh, Governor, here is my question. Do you think this specific safety measure should be repealed? Congressman, superficially, that is a reasonable statement that you have just made. How it is enforced and regulated is something of which I am ignorant. But what I do know is we have had more than 31,000 wells drilled in the Gulf of Mexico in my life. This is the only time anything like this, anything vaguely like this, 
has ever happened. And when you consider the amount of our domestic oil production that comes out of the Gulf and comes from offshore drilling elsewhere, when you consider the fact that we have an energy security, a military security, and a national security issue in this country because we import way too much foreign oil, including a lot from people who are not our friends, then I would not be in favor of anything that reduces the production of uh, domestic oil. I, uh, I think the risks are way too small compared to what you give up. So in other words, um, if this were to happen again, if we had 87 days of oil spewing out into our waters, um, you are saying that the risk of that far outweighs the economic situation. Is that, is, and I am not trying to put words in your mouth. I want to make sure I understand you. I understand. Because I will tell you, I saw a lot of what you saw. You, you're talking about. I saw, I saw the pelicans. I saw, uh, I talked to the fishermen. I talked to the tourism people. I, I even talked to the industry people, a lot of them. And you know what they said? They said, you know what, and this was before we knew the full impact of it. They said, you know what, we agree that we ought to have some kind, uh, we should have the ability to, and it should be proven ability to cap something like this before we even continue. Well, and I think beyond that, Congressman, it is very clear that this well blew out because normal standard procedures and protocols weren't followed. I don't think there's any question that corners were cut. I don't know whose fault it was. I don't know who the specific responsible party is. But I don't think there's any question that that was the cause of all this. And that is why I say the risk went out of 1 in 31,000 is worth taking when you are talking about something that is so important to the economy of the United States of America. That is why much. I have that view. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, the gentleman. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor Barber, for being here. Uh, along the lines of the negative effects of stricter drilling regulations on the offshore, offshore industry, uh, why don't we take a minute and uh, have you expound on uh, the effects that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Revenue and Enforcement has uh, has been issuing. Uh, well, let me let me back up. The, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management Revenue and Enforcement has been issuing a great deal of new regulations affecting offshore drilling. Have your constituents been in touch with you about these new rules? Yes. Okay. And uh, do you, do they find them problematic? Well. The people that talk to us don't know all the details of the rules. All they know is that the regulatory efforts of the government are shutting down the Gulf, have shut down the Gulf. I mentioned earlier, I, I, I was in Israel this winter, like in February, went on an offshore drilling rig. Two of the guys working on the rig were from Mississippi. Almost every American on that rig had been working in the Gulf of Mexico a year before. They had got run out of the Gulf because of the moratorium and because of the belief, the perception that, the, uh, that it was going to be a long time before there was going to be drilling again in the Gulf of Mexico. That is what we get, people who have lost their jobs, whose kids have lost their jobs, who are, worried about, uh, who are worried about this. The service, we have people who work offshore, but we also have significant service industries in our state that repair rigs, that build service boats, that work on boats and that. So it's a, it is a big industry in the Gulf South. Okay. How about, let's talk a little bit about BP's actions during the spill and recovery. Uh, there were uh, many officials and citizens that felt BP played too large a role in the uh, spill response and that the Federal Government should not have let them play this large of a role. And that was a common criticism that we heard in the media at the time of the spill as well. At any point, either during the disaster or during the recovery phase, did BP have too much of a say in the response? Well, no question. BP had a big say in the response, and they were paying for it. But I have to tell you, Congressman, sometimes BP was easier to deal with than the government. I mean, that is just a, a fact of life that we learn that sometimes the Federal Government is not the easiest group to, to do business with. In fairness to BP, for us, 
everything that we asked them to do, and of course everything we were asking for, they had to pay for. Everything that we asked them to do, they considered, and almost every time they did it, where many times we would ask the Federal Government for something, like skimmers, when we were trying to get skimmers, we thought the Federal Government was going to have to was supposed to have skimmers for us when the oil got close enough. Turns out we had to go get BP to give us the money to get some shipyards in Mississippi to build the skimmers. So we would have enough skimmers. So I am not going to berate that part of the Oil Pollution Act. What we didn't like was the usurpation of State sovereignty by the Federal Government. If uh, you wanted to put on your teacher's hat for a moment and grade the response efforts of BP, the Coast Guard, and the Obama administration, what grade would you give each of them? You know, when you have been through the worst natural disaster in American history as governor of Mississippi, it's, it's, you learn not to criticize people too harshly for unprecedented, unforeseen nat uh, disasters, natural or otherwise. But they had a hard time. Uh, they seemed slow to, to try to get in charge. Uh, we had the problems I am talking about with command and control. But I don't want to be overly critical, because when stuff like this happens, you make mistakes. And so that is why I, I try not to assess blame. Let's just figure out how to do it better. Uh, and I think that is very diplomatic and reasonable, because no one can uh, fully prepare for these. We always learn and we try to make improvements, and I, I think that uh, I agree with your statement. One last thing on the seafood. You, know, you said in your opening statement, safe, uh, the seafood is safe to eat. Uh, what about the reproduction, and are the seafood stocks where they should be, or is it too early to tell? Well, we have had no evidence whatsoever or finding of anything from the oil spill that uh, got into the reproductive chain. I mean, we are not seeing fish with four eyes or any, anything like that. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, we, we had a really great fall, but with the fresh water that is being allowed into the Mississippi Sound because of flood control on the river and the opening of the Bonnie Caray floodway, through the Lake Pontchartrain, we are getting an enormous amount of fresh water into the sound that is going to kill all the oysters. It's got nothing to do with BP, but it's going to, literally it is going to kill all the oysters. We will have to rebuild the oyster bed. The oysters can't get away. The shrimp and the fin fish, they all run away from the fresh water, and it shouldn't affect them. We have had some losses in dolphins, sea turtles that are more than normal. The peculiar thing about it is we started seeing it before the oil spill. Just a little bit before the oil spill, this started happening. So nobody has been able to tie it, but that is something we have got our antenna up about, is that we have seen mortality rates among sea mammals uh, and, and sea turtles for some reason have been rising since last March or so. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, sir. The gentleman's time has expired. We now go to the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Governor, I appreciate your coming. I have listened to what you have had to say. Uh, much of it is reasonable. <laughs> for example, when you say it is a lot better than having to litigate, and you have to litigate, that means everybody is messed up. So you have to have some impartial person. Um, I also agree that you have blessings and curses in your part of the of the um, economy. The United States depends on much of your economy with the oil and the seafood there, and they are sometimes at odds with one another. So there are certain kind of risks that have to be taken. I, I take it you would agree, therefore, that the best way to handle those risks is to prevent them. Well, well ma'am, if you mean I mean, quit drilling, all, quit drilling oil wells I mean, in the Gulf of Mexico. All, no, ma'am, I don't think well, that's well, why the best you, way. Well, I mean, obviously, Governor, well, I'm preventing sorry, I an oil decision. spill. I mean, preventing an oil spill. That's right. Follow the right protocols and procedures because so that's you don't have this, one to start with. Yes, sir. That's what this, this hearing is about. It's about the oil spill. Um, now, the administration uh, has focused on how to prevent it from happening again. But it has been 
uh, severely criticized for regulations that uh, would apparently accomplish that. It has been criticized for these regulations as too burdensome. It has been criticized because these regulations would cost jobs. Therefore, I was intrigued by what some of the, uh, from the very top of the oil industry, uh, uh, is saying, and I like your view on this. Um, uh, Let us take John Watson, who is the chairman and CEO of Chevron. Uh, he indicates that he himself, they themselves have a burden here. But he says, and I am quoting now, far from resisting uh, those rules, he means the regulations that are coming out, our industry is helping to strengthen them. The proactive, uncompromising approach to safety is the test we should all apply to any company, starting with our own. In an industry that is always edging up against the frontiers of geology and engineering, here goes your risk point, the best practices should be the only practices. Corporate responsibility does not end with meeting market demand. Would you agree with uh, Mr. Watson, the chairman of, of CEO, with his statement? As I understand the statement, I would, because I think what he's saying is, as the chairman of a big oil company, his incentive to, among others, is he doesn't want his stockholders to be out twenty billion dollars like the BP stockholders are, and that he's going to make sure they do it right the first time. And, and he is saying, and what is what is what is really interesting in what he is saying is that the company not only supports the administration's and new safety measures, but they are working with the administration to make them stronger. He, he does not appear to be fighting the regulations for which the administration has been criticized. I want to give you another example uh, from the top of the industry, the president of Shell, Marvin Odom, uh, again shouldering his own responsibility, but he says additional safeguards beyond what he himself would do, must be strengthened across the industry to develop the capacity to quickly respond and resolve a deep water well blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, regardless how, of how unlikely it is that this situation will occur. Now, you know, that doesn't come from members of Congress or from environmentalists. That comes from the top of the oil industry. And I just want to know if you would agree with Mr. Odom as well. I certainly don't take any issue with what you said. I, I, because I agree with you about the importance of preventing uh, rather, rather than litigating, as, as, as you said, uh, the only way to do that is to hold the industry accountable. Here you have another oil executive argu arguing for it more robust requirements uh, to demonstrate uh, the capacity to cap a well if there is a blowout. I, I just think it is important to bring out how the industry, instead of fighting regulations now, is working with the administration for tougher regulations. I think their concern, Governor, is that these regulations be across the board, so some of them are not engaged in spending more money to be more safe than others. So if there are regulations saying all of you are held now to the highest standard given this blowout, then everybody, it seems to me, in the marketplace will be on an, a, an even playing field. And the gentlelady's time has expired. The I would, I would just simply say, ma'am, uh, these, these companies uh, have huge incentives to self-regulate. We went from uh, for 50 years with one, well, no occasions in 31,000 wells before BP. It's the only time it's ever happened. And I think what the CEO of Chevron is saying, the CEO of uh, Shell are saying is, yeah, we want to work with the company, with the government. We want to make sure there's rational regulation. That's not saying every regulation anybody can think of is something that we're for. In fact, Mr. Watson has been very, very public in saying that the moratorium was terrible and was a huge mistake. 
There is a difference between a moratorium and new regulations. Well, it is a form of regulation. We are going to shut you down and while we are writing new regulations. But, so while everything that you said I am very comfortable with, there are connotations there that I don't think we should take too far. You know, if the idea is that no risk is too small and no cost is too high, uh, I don't think any of any, any company in any industry would agree with that. That and we of have course, to balance risk with cost. Of course, Governor, that's a, straw, that's a straw man. That's a straw man. The gentleman you, from Pennsylvania is recognized, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield my time back to the chair. I thank the gentleman, uh, Governor. Sir. Yeah, that means he's giving me the time. I couldn't see him. I'm sorry. Uh, I have no, no shortage of questions and responses. Governor, are you familiar with the Marine Well Containment Company? No, ma'am. No, sir. Sorry. I was thinking about Ms. Norton. Yeah, no, this no, is sir. a different line of questioning. Uh, the, uh, they're, the, they're the group that basically is overseeing a billion dollars worth of uh, funds that uh, were, put, were put together by the various oil companies so that if this happens again, that one in 31,000 times, they would have a whole different category of response. Does that refresh your memory? I Did, didn't know the, by that name, but it's the industry effort for, for a post-oil spill. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with the program, not by the name. Right. And it wasn't that billion dollars spent by the companies who had never had a significant spill in the Gulf? I think exclusively. Right. Exxon, Mobil, Shell, Chevron, and Conoco. So uh, I just wanted to make sure we got that into the record. There's another thing I want to get into the record. And, uh, as you know, Governor, when you and I first met, I was a businessman, and you were a recovering lawyer then, too. And that was a long time ago. It takes a long time to it takes recover. takes a long time to recover. But the number you gave earlier was, was meaningful enough to repeat it. 1.4 million barrels per year seep into the Gulf approximately automatically, right? Yes, sir. That is what the USGIS says. And for eons, the Gulf has absorbed that. Uh, it, it diffuses it, 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 things eat it eventually. It ultimately uh, uh, is part of the ecosystem. Well, let's just go through the numbers here as a, as a businessman who always want to, wants to figure out the P&L as quickly as possible. The, uh, the Federal Government estimates that approximately 25 percent of that 4 point, or the Federal Government estimates 4.9 million barrels seeped in, or were, came out of the well into the Gulf. Approximately 25 percent, or a little over 1.2 million were recovered. That leaves us about 3.7 million barrels that got into the Gulf in this disaster. I am not reducing this for a minute, but let us just do the numbers. So of that, approximately another 25 percent was burned off, uh, and another 25 percent was estimated to be dispersed using disbursement. And we all understand there is some controversy about whether disbursement. So if you take the amount that was evaporated and burned off, you are now down to about half. You are down into the 2 point some million, nearly 3 million barrels. No matter how you look at it, whether you take the whole amount or the reduced amounts, you have got less than three years worth of oil went in in, in in one short quarter of a year period. And you got about two years if you give credit for these efforts to mitigate. Is it any surprise to you that the Gulf fish, shellfish, and so on is doing just fine when, in fact, this is essentially including the natural amount that is still coming in the Gulf. This is about three years' worth, maybe, total uh, that went into the Gulf in one year, that this is not such a big thing, even though it is a big thing to us individually and a big thing when it gets to your shores. Congressman, right after the oil spill happened, I when I say right in the first month or so, we had professors and, and experts who told us that the Gulf would, over a period of time, for lack of a better term, digest this, that there are microorganisms in the Gulf of Mexico and I think in other places where you have oil seeps that eat the oil. Including Santa Barbara, California, where it has right. been yeah, coming ashore for years. I think the, probably the first place in the country that it was ever talked about was Santa Barbara, that they, that they have oil that seeps through the floor there. But there were scientists that predicted that the Gulf would eat this, essentially eat this up, that those little organisms, that is what they do, and that there are a lot of them, and that they would multiply. Now, 
if you're in the job and you're in the job of head of disaster management, you don't assume that's true. So we never assumed it was true, but it looks like to the layman from afar that that is in fact what happened. That the microorganisms were able to to manage this, and maybe that wasn't totally unforeseeable because they do eat up so much oil every year. Two other things I would mention, unlike Exxon Valdez, this was light oil, and secondly, the water was warm. Exxon Valdez water very, very cold. Here the water pretty dang warm, and the light cuts, the benzenes, the toluenes, the xylenes, the, uh, they all evaporate faster in that, uh, in that warm water. I thank the gentleman. Time has expired. I recognize Mr. Clay for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Governor, for uh, coming today to the hearing. Thank you, sir. Governor, the uh, National Commission report noted something that may seem obvious, which is that offshore oil and gas industry is inherently dangerous, but the Commission also reported that accidents are surprisingly common that involve loss of well control. Uh, Here is what the report said. Drilling rigs are themselves dangerous places to work. Dents with heavy equipment, hazardous chemicals, and flammable oil and gas, all surrounded by the open sea environment far from shore, uh, where weather and water conditions can change rapidly and dramatically. The seriousness of these risks to worker safety and the environment are underscored by the sheer number of accidents. Governor, the Commission report then says that there have been 76 accidents in the Gulf between 1996 and 2009 that involved loss of well control accidents, and many of these accidents occurred very close to your State. Were you aware of these figures, 76 accidents? Of course. My State is an oil and gas State, not just offshore. And a drilling rig is dangerous. I mean, you see a lot of people who worked in the oil fields who lost fingers, got hurt, you know, got hurt one way or another, got burned. I mean, it's a it's a dangerous thing. The the accidents you're talking about, though, all turned out to be were managed. They were manageable and managed. This the BP Macondo well spill is unique. But, but, yes, sir, it is a dangerous industry, and there are accidents that happen on shore and off. But do you think uh, these numbers indicate that new safety measures were long overdue well before the uh, deep water oil spill? I think the industry tries very hard to protect their people because it is very expensive when they don't. Let me and uh, so it, uh, rational regulation is something we ought to all be for. We need to be careful of excessive, unnecessary, harmful regulation, is my point. Okay. Fair enough, Governor. Uh, some have suggested that new safety measures should apply only to deep water wells because that is where BP's rig was when it exploded. Do you believe that shallow water drilling should be exempt from new safety measures the administration is implementing? Well, again, if you are talking about safety measures, to try to prevent injuries, I, I, I don't think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about treating shallow water wells the, the same, same as deep water would, wells. Deep. My only view is I would treat deep water wells in the Gulf of Mexico the same way as deep water wells off the shore of Brazil. Thank you for that answer. Um, Governor Dr. Harriet Perry of the University of Southern Mississippi's Gulf Coast Research Lab identified oil droplets in blue crab larvae last summer. Uh, this was the first time she had seen anything like that in 42 years of studying the species. Do you think those oil droplets were due to the moratorium or the BP disaster? If they had showed up in any samples that we ever took out of the, out of the Gulf, I would have been concerned about them, I any seafood samples. And we are very proud of the Gulf Coast Laboratory of USM, but uh, that finding was never replicated 
or we didn't have sim any, sim any similar findings in any samples that came out of the catch. And that's why it hasn't, that hasn't bothered me. We, uh, we just have had no seafood sample, and neither is the Federal Government, according to what they reported to us, that had any kind of evidence of oil pollution on it. Well, there are now, now, Governor, here, here, there are a number of reports of red snapper showing up with lesions in the Gulf. A Louisiana State University professor is fairly confident that these lesions uh, are consistent with the toxic <coughs> oil exposure. And I can share it with you, but here is a photo of the lesion on the red snapper. Uh, do you think that uh, that was a, a result of the, of the spill? Again, Congressman, if this were showing up in any samples of seafood taken by the government, Federal Government or State Government, I would be more concerned about it than when a college professor finds it in some anomalous place. Now, but but I mean, would you I'm, be concerned about digesting this? If it were showing up in seafood samples that we are sampling by the thousands between the Federal Government and the State Government, then that would give me real pause, but we are not. The fact that we are not finding it means that I am really not, uh, I don't know what the professors are finding or, or reporting to the news media. Well, the gentleman's time has expired. The question has been asked and answered. We now go to the gentleman you, from sir. Texas. And please, uh, Mr. Farenholt. Please do not get into this Texas versus Mississippi oil, okay? Absolutely. You're recognized for five minutes. <laughs> Absolutely not. Texas and Mississippi uh, share a common uh, bond that we both border the Gulf of Mexico and are both deeply affected by uh, what happens in the Gulf of Mexico, both environmentally and economically. I think you alluded in the answer to the one of your answers to the previous questions, uh, Governor. There are other countries that are drilling in the Gulf of Mexico in whose oil uh, and gas rigs, uh, if there were to be an accident uh, similar to BP or, or even smaller, would, would affect our coast. Is that not correct? Particularly Florida. Right, so well, you've got Texas, you, Texas too, sure. Sorry, but yeah, absolutely. You've got you've got the Brazilians uh, looking at drilling. Cuba's offering leases just immediately nearby to Florida. Mexico for a long time has been exploring the Gulf of Mexico. I realize you're only a recovering attorney. I'm a recovering attorney too. But I, your recollection of law school, U.S. doesn't have any jurisdiction over any of those. Uh, any of those drilling operations. We can act every imaginable regulation, and uh, Cuba or Mexico or Brazil could say, meh, no. That is correct. I understand it. So don't you think it might be a better use of our resources rather than crippling our domestic uh, companies and our domestic exploration, 25 percent of our domestic oil supply, that we might be focusing on how to respond in the event uh, one of these accidents uh, or any sort of accident occurs again? I do. I, I do think it's more. I think it's appropriate that the oil industry is doing it itself, paying for it. They know more about it than anybody else. But it looks to me like we ought to be using our resources to have more American energy. That we need to get ourselves off of foreign energy, and the best way to do that is to increase the supply and production of American energy. Right. And this has hurt that because this is a big source of domestic oil, and the number of permits for new deep water wells, which produce 80 percent of the 30 percent, about a fourth of all our oil, is down 85 percent the first year. And whether it is coal or oil or gas or, or hydraulic fracturing, uh, we need to produce more American energy. Right. And so no, and, and no, and in your opinion, no amount of government regulation is going to protect us from what other countries are doing? Well, if we have rational regulation, and th th that is good, right. but to have excessive regulation, unnecessary regulation, that's that's bad. And regulations like the and, and slowdowns in issuing permits, I think you'd consider to be falling under uh, to be a problem too. Of course it is. And like Texas, I assume uh, Mississippi's seen significant uh, job loss uh, right. as a result of this. We have, though most of the guys have just left. And are you all seeing assets that have been based in your uh, state moving into other areas uh, of the world, uh, 
drilling platforms. What we saw, like. what we saw happen after the moratorium, some of the big rigs came in for maintenance. Good time to good right. time for maintenance because you can't work. But after the maintenance is done, they left. And you know the way the industry works, those big rigs they go work on big jobs. They're very expensive to move not only in cost of moving, but opportunity costs. They get paid huge amounts of money a day to operate them. Whether they will come back, how soon they will come back is a very serious issue. So we saw not only the jobs move, but we saw the drilling rigs that produce the jobs go to Australia, go to Angola, Brazil. So that's a big, that's a big damage to us, not just in jobs on the platforms, but jobs in the service industry. All right. Well, and I appreciate your coming up and taking the time to share your uh, experiences with us. And I know your time is valuable, so I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, would the gentleman Thank yield? You, oh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Governor, 250,000 barrels a day less are going to be taken out of the Gulf. If, if more than a quarter of that is Mississippi related, econ economic related, what does that do to your economy relative to oil in the foreseeable future? That is the estimate. It is undenied at this point for the next two well, years. We get so little of it. We get so little I am not of talking money. about the royalty revenues. I am talking about the jobs. Well, it does have an effect on jobs. We have a lot of people who work offshore. As I said, it's, I don't mean this as precision. But four of the 11 people killed on the rig were from Mississippi, which gives you a sense of, of the number of people that we have work in the industry on rigs, in the, uh, in the service industries. We have companies in my state that manufacture drilling rigs, yeah. that build service boats. That, 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 so that's, it ripples all through the economy. Uh, Governor, last question. Isn't it, isn't it really uh, a question of do we get it in America or do we get it somewhere else? Isn't that really the Gulf question today? Well, if you look at when has the United States had reduced use of oil, it's every time been a recession. And so I don't want a recession. If we are going to keep a strong economy, we have got to produce more energy in the United States, including oil, and to go shoot the best goose we have got laying golden eggs, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, where we are getting 30 percent of our oil, or we were, and that production is going down now, and it is going to keep going down. Remember, oil production today is based on decisions that were made in the past, normally several years in the past. A moratorium is one of the few things that, that has an immediate impact. When we see what we are seeing right now with high energy prices, the speculators are speculating the U.S. is going to be producing less and less oil because they think the administration's policies will result in that. So they are betting the price of oil is going to go up. And then you take that with the value of the dollar, which oil prices are denominated in dollars, and as the value of the dollar goes down, then that is a double whammy for the people who are paying $4 for gasoline. And the people that think you are going to deal with that by raising taxes on oil companies forget that they won't pay those taxes. They are just going to pass it along to the guy who pumps gas into his pickup truck. And, and, and so that is why the best thing, produce more oil, and I believe at the, in the end of the day, not next week or next month, that is the best thing to keep oil prices reasonable. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Davis is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Governor, for being here. Thank you, sir. I have listened intently to your testimony. Of course, I grew up in the Mississippi Delta. Did you really? On the other side of the river near Greenville, Mississippi, just a few miles. And as Dick Gregory knows, in Chicago, we finally say that the only place where you will find more African Americans from Mississippi is in Mississippi than in Chicago. <laughs> Amen. And so we have a tremendous relationship with the state itself, and we watch very closely what takes place and what goes on. I know that we are talking about the worst environmental disaster in the history of our country. But as you indicated in your testimony, it also has massive 
economic impact, uh, particularly in the fishing and tourism industries. And I, I want to focus a little bit there. According to the NOAA, the total amount of shrimp caught commercially in the Gulf decreased 27 percent from 2009 to 2010. The amount of shrimp caught commercially in Mississippi was down 60 percent last year from the year before. Could you share, and you have done it uh, eloquently, a bit more of the economic impact? that has occurred in the State as a result of the oil spill? The fishing industry hurt very badly uh, because waters were closed. Federal waters were closed first. Mississippi waters were closed once we had encroachment. Louisiana, because they were closer to the well, their waters were closed very early as well. And this is, our, this is principal fisheries for us for, for shrimp. I mean, we have big shrimp boats that will go all the way down the Texas coast and come all the way back around the Florida coast, but there are not that many of them that are that big that go that far. So we have a lot of fishermen in the shrimp industry who, whose waters were closed to them. Their losses were mitigated by the fact that BP was willing to hire their boats to be part of this Vessels of Opportunity program. About 1,100 boats participated, and most days we'd have five, six, seven hundred boats out there, and they would be getting paid. A f Some of them weren't made fishing, but the processors got clobbered, and so the fishermen are nowhere if they don't have processors. And and so while they were getting a chance to be helped, there was nobody who was helping the processors, and the, without the processor, there's no fishermen. And so fishing was hurt that way, recreational fishing, which is a real industry in my state. There are people from Chicago who come down there and pay boat captains to take them out fishing. Shut out, shut down. Again, they got some relief from the VU program, but hurt very badly. Uh, so just in, that, just in that little small segment, before you ever talk about motels, restaurants, uh, Louisiana, to their great credit, they have New Orleans. And if, if there's oil on the beach at Venice, tourists still come to New Orleans. Are you confident that our Food and Drug Administration, that our Environmental Protection Agency, that the agencies that we rely upon to determine the safety in many instances of especially the things that we consume, that, that they are equipped? to really give us the information that we need to know to feel comfortable and secure? I have no reason not to be, Congressman, and so I am. It is a, it's a, it's a team, uh, state and federal, but uh, yes, sir? Let me ask you, other than perhaps uh, the lifting of any moratorium, what else can the federal government do that might assist with the economy? We know that the economy obviously was hurt badly. We know what the economy was even before the spill. What, what can the Federal Government do to add further? Uh, the Federal Government is, is able to collect enormous fines under the Clean Water Act. Now, the Federal Government could assess those fines and through whatever process, either by agreement or by litigation, say BP is going to pay X billions. Federal government could take that and just put it in the general treasury and move on, use it to reduce the debt. You know, it might cover a day or two worth of deficit. But we think the best thing the federal government could do is let some of the fine money, and there is legislation in the Senate, I believe, to, to let most of the fine money go to the states, let the states use the money for, with flexibility for economic growth there. Maybe that it has to be related to the Gulf and the Gulf economy, but we are going to have people who were fishermen two years ago that are not fishermen today and they are never going to be fishermen again because of the capital investment and the cost. We need to create jobs for them on the coast, maybe at the port. 
Uh, maybe in Alabama, they've got something totally different. Maybe in Florida, there's a whole different concept. But we would like to see a significant part of the fine money be given to the states, and the states allow the flexibility to use the money to produce the maximum economic growth in the coastal areas for that state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman, for asking. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Hello, Governor. Hey, Congressman. I, in Idaho, obviously, we don't have an oil industry, so I don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I think about common sense. It seems like there is a lot of common sense just lacking here. And I am going to just give you an example. You have had a colloquy with several people here in the panel, I mean, on, oh, on this side. And, and sometimes common sense just seems to lack in Washington, D.C. A couple of weeks ago or a couple, maybe a month ago, the First Lady, her plane was uh, close to, they, they claimed that there was close to an accident. And apparently she was within three uh, miles of another plane. And the regulations said that all planes should be within five miles of each other, and apparently the First Lady was within three miles. And I will get to my point, and I think you will get it in just a second. So the response in Washington, D.C. was not, hey, geez, somebody screwed up, and they failed to comply with the regulation. They should have been five miles instead of three miles. The response in Washington was, we need new regulations. And it seems like that is all I ever hear about in Washington, D.C. When somebody screws up, when somebody makes a mistake, we don't say, hey, that idiot didn't follow the regulations. What we say is, we need new regulations. And it is just, to me, incomprehensible that all we can ever think about is adding regulation upon regulation when the regulators are not doing their job. They already have regulations that should actually be enforced, and instead all we ever talk about is making it more difficult for industries, for private enterprise, for individuals to live, to survive. So can you explain to me, and I think you mentioned this earlier, I think you mentioned that the Macondo incident occurred because regulations were not followed. In fact, I think your word was that some corners were cut. Can you explain that a little bit more to me, what, what you meant by that? I can't, I, I can't cite the regulatory regime, but in the normal standards and protocols of shutting in a well, it was clear from the reports at the time, and nobody has denied it, that they didn't follow the standards and protocols that the industry had, uh, had been using, settled on, and had worked with great result for a long, 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 long time. Uh, this was widely reported, and so it, it always seemed to me pretty clear why the well blew out. And this was reportedly, uh, with again with nobody arguing, this was a pretty tough well. They had trouble with this well. It had uh, it had hiccups. Uh, it had belches of natural gas that they had trouble with. They had to shut the well down at least once during this. So this wasn't a well to cut corners on. This was a big elephant well. But they did cut the corners, and, and you're right. When you say the issue is following the regulations we got now, uh, I can't improve on your statement. So why is it that here in Washington we don't seem to understand this? Why, why is it that we can't understand that we have regulations that can I think you used a number of, we have done this in the Gulf over 30,000 times, and this is the first time something like this happens. But can, can you repeat that again? You, you said that yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, there have been more than 31,000 oil wells drilled in the Gulf of Mexico in the last 50 years or since they opened the Gulf in our four states. And uh, there's never been anything vaguely like this to happen. Okay, uh, it's just I, I think I, I will yield the rest of my time to the chairman. I just, for the life of me, I cannot understand what we can not in Washington D.C. just understand that if we enforce the regulations that are in place, we will actually be able to have a good environment. We will be able to have good water. We will be able to have jobs, and the economy will improve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you know, I'm going to follow up on the gentleman's line of questioning because I think it was excellent. Governor, uh, on the day that the oil well 
blue, 100 miles off your shore, there were two MMS officials, a father and son team, that, that came on, reviewed, passed, and left. Isn't that so, as far as you know? I, I don't know that, but I, that, it wouldn't I, surprise I, I you, assume though. it's true if you said it. Well, you know, we're going to have the administrator of the successor organization to MMS up here next, and that's going to be one of our questions is, why is it that what failed before won't fail again? And that's going to be a line of questioning is not just other new regulations, but an agency that failed to ensure safety, what has changed there? So hopefully they will be as candid as you have been. Well, I, I have to say to you, I accept that because the 31,000 wells I actually got from Janet Napolitano. So I accept people in authority's statements of fact. So I, I accept the fact those two guys were there. I, I thank you, Governor. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Uh, and by the way, I, had, I didn't have to look up what chutzpah was in your, in your opening statement, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it was interesting to see you using imported words. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Where I come from, chutzpah is a very common word. Um, and I want to welcome Governor uh, Haley Barber to, uh, to the committee. And uh, just speaking for myself, I regret very much you are not running for President. I think you would have added some good common political sense and a lot of good humor. Uh, and what a humanized a process that desperately needs it. So we are sorry. Thank you. We are not going to see your uh, candidacy. Thank you very much, Congressman. That is very gracious. And thank you for your service. Um, I, let me, Governor, I, I was listening to your exchange with uh, Congressman Burton and complaining about the negative media attention. And I, as somebody who ran a very large county with 1.1 million people, I can sympathize. But on the other hand, was it the bad media that caused a hit to the Mississippi economy, or was it the devastation of the oil spill itself? Congressman, we didn't have devastation. I mean, the, the problem was the news media took the very, very, very worst areas in Louisiana, and they repeatedly showed that over and over and over and over, and it gave people the impression that's the way it was all over the Gulf Coast. They would actually have stories about Mississippi and pictures from Louisiana. Mm. And uh, you may not have been in here, literally, on our 80-mile shoreline, we never closed one foot of beach for one day except on one occasion. We had a high tide either right before or right after a hurricane missed us, and it pushed some water over the highway and through a culvert, and it pushed some oil paddies up there. And we closed that beach for more than we actually closed that beach overnight. That is the only time. But if you watch TV in Virginia, you saw Louisiana and you thought Mississippi and Florida and Alabama, for that matter, and Texas were all the same way. And that's that's what killed our tourist season. Yes, common problem with the media sometimes. In terms Amen. of images. That is bipartisan. Yep, absolutely. Um, when you look back now, and, and, and if someone gave you a truth serum, um, <clears throat> do you think, in retrospect, that the process for permitting and approving Deepwater Horizon oil rig was flawed? For example, it got a categorical exclusion under the process, because the process allowed for that. In retrospect, was that a mistake? The NEPA, and, and one other aspect, Governor, if, and then please respond. Uh, the NEPA process predicted, under the NEPA review, which was truncated, that under the worst case scenario, we were looking at 4,300 barrels of oil spilled, and it would never reach the shore. Congressman, in answer to your question, I think that what we had done for 50 years with more than 31,000 oil wells with very positive results, in fact, nothing like this ever having happened, I would not take issue with that. I mean, regardless of what we do, occasionally you are going to have the bad outcome. But we are not going to make people quit taking left-hand turns. We are not going to outlaw left-hand turns because they are a little bit more dangerous than regular driving. And I really see this, that rational regulation of this had resulted in 
31,000 times, nothing like that. Now, well, now this has happened one time. Does that mean we have to turn the world upside down? And I think the answer is no. Governor, I would agree with you. Um, I don't think we have to turn the world upside down. But that, really, my question isn't that. That is not our only choice. The question is, could we, in retrospect, have tightened up regulation and been more rigorous in the review process such that, and the enforcement, of, for example, get the blowout protection equipment that might have stemmed the spill uh, or contained it? I mean, the, you know, I take your point that the devastation wasn't what was present, presented visually on television. I fully respect and understand that. But on the, on the other hand, at one point, the extent of the spill on the surface of the water would have gone from my district in Northern Virginia, Dale City, all the way to New York City if it were superimposed on the map here. That is eye popping. And that is of deep concern to all of us. And so all I am asking is, don't turn the world upside down, but could we not on a bipartisan basis agree that in light of that experience, it only requires one to create such environmental havoc? I mean, this is in the category, it seems to me, of a nuclear disaster. It only requires one to, you know, turning the left hand and having an accident, God forbid, is a terrible thing if someone is hurt, but it is a very contained thing. These things are not. If, if the Chairman is correct that there were two government regulators on the rig that day, and if the reports that have been written over and over and over without contradiction, they did not follow the normal protocols and they did not follow the standards, and these two regulators were on the well that day, I think the Congressman from Idaho's point is the right point. It is not that we need more regulation, it is that we need to actually enforce the regulations in real life. If, if that is factually accurate, I have no reason to think it is not. Mr. Uh, Chairman, would you indulge me just one to clarify? The gentleman is recognized for one more question. I think, uh, just a clarification, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, do you mean by that, let us have the full regulatory process that is on the books right now, no more exclusions? Yeah, I couldn't go that far because of my lack of information. There may be some exclusions that are well-founded that are like we see in many, many other processes, regulatory and otherwise, you know, like you fill out the form, if the answer to C is no, skip down to F. And I just don't know if those exclusions are of that type. Thank you, Governor. And thank you, Mr. Thank, Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Governor, this may come as a surprise to you, but I haven't had my round of questioning yet. <laughs> and I'm going last. Oh, I may, may, may be another uh, minority member coming, but I'm going now. I recognize myself for five minutes. Governor, uh, I'm going to put up on the board uh, a quote from Secretary Salazar for your comment, and I'll read it. There is no question that the suspension of deep water drilling will have a significant negative economic uh, impact on direct and indirect employment in the oil and gas industry, as well as other secondary economic consequences. That is correct. But he did it anyway. That is correct. Can you explain why somebody would know that it was going to hurt economically? And uh, he, by the way, he follows that up which isn't on this quote, he follows this up by noting that there is an extremely good history of safety in, your, in the oil industry. Mr. Chairman, uh, my own view is that the policy of the administration is to increase the cost of energy so that people will use less of it and therefore there will be less pollution, and alternative forms of energy will become more economically competitive. I have said that publicly a thousand times, so I might as well say it here. When they did the moratorium, that was my assumption that this was consistent with that policy. And look, it is one policy that works. I mean, we got $4 gasoline. And gasoline in January of 2009 was $1.80-something. 
but that is what I took to be the rationale for that, is to make these other alternatives economically competitive, you had to increase the price of, of oil and other traditional. Well, they have certainly done that. Uh, by the way, the quote that wasn't on the screen is, I am also aware that as a general matter, the safety record for deep water drilling has been good. I am going to go to one more uh, very, uh, a very interesting quote, because the, uh, the next panel is going to be dealing with this. Last week, or two weeks ago, as it was, Secretary Hayes was here and, and told us there was no connection between high oil prices and domestic production, meaning he was quite sure that if we drilled more here, it wouldn't change the global price. I am going to take you to page 23 of an MMS report. MMS, it is titled MMS Economic Impact Assessment. At the time, they were assessing, and I will just read it because it is a little hard to read that one, they were assessing that at $75 a barrel, which is where we were, not our where we are, unfortunately, that if production went down by 84,000 barrels a day, 0.84 million barrels a day, that we would have an increase of about 47 cents a barrel. Now, it went down by three times that. Now, you are you're not an oil speculator, neither am I, but it would not surprise you that if you went down, if you got a half a dollar increase for such a minor one, and if you decreased by three times that amount, wouldn't you guess it would go up a whole lot more than that? Ten, fifteen dollars a barrel could certainly happen if you took that much out of a, a, a limited economy. And particularly if the market believes that this is going to be policy for a while that you are going to have a moratorium in the Gulf, that you are going to reduce production in the Gulf, that you are going to issue 85 percent fewer new deep water drilling permits, that the market sees that as there is going to be less U.S. oil production. And while whoever said you can't affect the price of oil overnight, well, of course, that is absolutely true. But if there is a belief that the U.S. is going to produce less and less oil going forward, but particularly because of government policy, then the price of oil is going to go up. One more thing I wanted to get into the record. Governor, you are one of the many states that are right-to-work states, aren't you? Yes, sir. In fact, every state in the Gulf of Mexico, every oil state is a right-to-work state. I think all the states in the Gulf of Mexico, I don't know if every oil state is. Well, I'm sorry. Every California is an oil state. We are not right-to-work. But every Gulf uh, oil uh, state is, in fact, a right-to-work state. That is my belief. D does it surprise you that, uh, that the policies of this administration seem to be targeting the economic well-being of your area? And I am not trying to say it is a big plot or anything else, but it does seem like if 9-11 aircraft fly into the Pentagon, fly into the Twin Towers, the next day we are figuring out how to get airplanes back in the air. And yet the economy, the seafood economy, the tourism economy, and the oil economy of your states, when you are suffering, it seems like there is no limit to how long this administration will take to have a moratorium to think about whether or not they can let you do something that is so vital to your economy. Well, the moratorium was a mistake. It was very harmful, not only to our state, but I think more importantly, it was very harmful to the country. And, uh, I, I can't read what's in people's hearts or, or what's inside their heads, but uh, I, I have noted, I, I, and I haven't said it here, but I think it is appropriate to say, there has been an effort to raise taxes on the oil industry because it's a very profitable industry. But it's Every in, day here, Governor. It's, it's interesting, in the Senate bill to raise taxes on the oil industry, the idea was deficit reduction to raise the taxes $2 billion a day. I mean, $2 billion in a year. The problem is that is half of one day's deficit. You know, you would have to raise the taxes on the oil industry by a factor of 700 times more than that because $2 billion tax increase on the oil industry is equal to one half of one day's deficit. I mention that because it says to me that can't be the real reason. I mean, the real reason can't be to, to touch the deficit, because it doesn't even touch the deficit. And, of course, as we know, the guy who's going to pay it is the one who pumps gas in his, 
in his truck. So do I think there are some people who don't like the oil industry or think it's a good whipping boy politically? I suspect that, but I can't say what's inside people's hearts or minds and don't pretend to. But I do know we wouldn't do anything about the deficit. You know, Governor, I couldn't agree with you more that we can't be sure of somebody's motives, although I can be sure that if, uh, if Wall Street were to cause an, an economic meltdown, that this administration would allow it to be up and running the next day, because they did. The last administration did, this administration did. We have had great disasters and great impacts in other areas of the economy, but amazingly, the reforms came after everyone was back up and running, not before they were allowed to go back up and run. Governor, you have been very kind with your time. We appreciate your being here. Uh, you are probably the most welcome relief to, uh, to us in Congress uh, to see somebody who is doing the right things, who is making the right decisions, who is steering a course for your state. And we appreciate your taking your valuable time to be up here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank you, Governor. Congressman, thank you, Congressman Cummings. We will now take a five-minute recess to set up the next panel. Hey, Congressman. You're very gracious to say that.